Well, good evening. Um, some housekeeping points, first of all. The university does ask everyone using their or visiting their buildings to wear a mask. So uh, if you can, we'd ask you to wear one, unless you're speaking. If you're going to ask a question at the end, of course, do take your mask off in. Or if you've got any, re any uh, particular reason for not wearing one, we re rely on your good sense there. Uh, in the unlikely event that there might be a fire alarm, there are exits here and at the rear of the theatre. I think that's all I need to say on those scores. So we can now begin. And I, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this, the 17th annual St. Cuthbert Society Fellows Lecture. In the real world, as it were, you've no idea what a pleasure it is to be able to do this. Uh, it is our 17th lecture. The 16th was given entirely online in March of this year. So it's, uh, and this is the first one, which is a hybrid event. So we have, we have uh, members of the audience joining us online as well. So welcome to them. Uh, St. Cuthbert Society is one of the oldest student communities of Durham University, uh, originally having been founded by undergraduates themselves. It is now one of the constituent colleges of the university and the fellows of St. Cuthbert Society are a group of senior common room members recognized by the college as contributing, uh, con as contributing substantially to its life and uh, in some way. I, uh, I'm Robert Banks and I have the particular honor of chairing the fellows and this evening's lecture. Our speaker, Gavin O'Malley, is one of ours as one of our own. He is uh, an alumnus of St. Cuthbert Society, having graduated with a BA in psychology in 1995, followed by master's degrees in counseling and forensic psychology. Since 1997, he has had a, a distinguished career in the prison service, first as a psychologist, then psychotherapist, and more recently as governor. Gavin currently works as the prison service director, uh, I beg your pardon, the prison group director for long-term and high security prisons in the North. Uh, accountable for the performance and management oversight of uh, six prisons. As prison group director, Gavin also holds uh, cross-directorate responsibility for safety, security, intelligence, and counter-terrorism. We uh, have among the fellows of St. Cuthbert Society someone much better placed than me to give a fuller introduction to our speaker. Uh, as head of learning, skills, and employment uh, um, at HMP Franklin from 2003 to 2011, Ian Harrison was Gavin's colleague during that time. And Zoom permitting, with uh, uh, we'll continue this. Now I have to let me stop sharing. And we should now find Ian there. No, he's still talking. There you go. The wonders of Zoom. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Gavin. First of all, uh, apologies for not being able to attend tonight. Barbara and I were both very much looking forward to being with you and having the opportunity to catch up with Gavin, who I haven't seen for a good number of years. But sadly, we can't be there. We're both well, thanks, and almost through the other side of self-isolation. So this week, you could say that we've been trapped in safety. <laughs> as Bob mentioned, Gavin and I first met in 2003 as members of the senior management team at HMP Franklin, where Gavin was head of psychology and I was head of learning skills and employment. 
I don't think either of us were aware at that time of the cusp connection, as that sort of topic wasn't likely to come up in day-to-day -day prison conversation. The number one governor at that time was a certain Phil Coppel, who many of you will recall gave a fellows lecture on a similar subject some nine years ago. So what goes around comes around. The senior management team at Franklin was made up of the governor and his deputy and about six functional heads from key areas within the prison. Most of the team dealt with the day-to-day -day secure running of the establishment, such as security, finance, residential areas and healthcare. But Gavin and I had a common responsibility of overseeing the delivery of key activities and interventions that were intended to help improve a prisoner's well-being, behaviour and educational level in preparation for release. Although for many of our clients, that was a long way away and in some ways made the job even more complex. However, there was a degree of overlap and interrelationship between our two departments, which required coordination and cooperation. Now, even at that time, the prison service was talking about sequencing. Curiously, a phrase now adopted by Ofsted in relation to adult learning. But I'm referring to the sequencing of interventions and the importance of addressing a prisoner's identified needs in the right order and at the right time during their sentence. So a great deal of our time was devoted to trying to achieve this. Not without its problems, of course, as it's never as easy as it sounds. And in prison, there are always complications. And that's why I'm interested to hear what Gavin has to say about more recent developments in addressing offending behaviour and how they are having a positive impact on rehabilitation and public protection. As you can imagine, working at Franklin was always challenging, occasionally rewarding, but also very interesting, as no two days were the same. You never knew what you were coming into each morning, apart from the certainty of the daily briefing and grilling about targets. As a senior management team, we met frequently, and I can remember the occasion when Gavin announced that he was putting himself forward to the Governor Training Programme. And I must say, I was taken by surprise, because I hadn't seen that one at all. I knew how intensive and demanding the training was and how full on the job becomes if you're successful. Everything considered, I thought, well, that's a brave choice and not one to be taken lightly. But all credit to him, he's clearly made a great success of his move. If I remember rightly, during the early stages of his training, one of his first placements was as a senior or principal officer on the residential wing at Deerbolt Young Offender Institute in Barnard Castle. At first, we got quite lengthy bulletins via email about what he'd been doing that day, what he'd been involved in, what had been happening, etc. But then as time went on, the updates got shorter and shorter, and the period of time between bulletins got longer until eventually they ceased completely. The workload was clearly building up, leaving no time for writing bulletins. Well, here we are several years on, and it's very pleasing to see, to see Gavin has not only returned to HP Franklin as governor, but has also taken on the role of prison group director for long-term and high security prisons. But more importantly, he's now returned to St Cuthbert Society to present this year's annual Fellows Lecture. So it gives me great pleasure to hand you over to Gavin O'Malley. Thank you. Ian, if you can still hear me, thank you very much. This is like this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. 
so kind and uh, your memory is impeccable. <laughs> it's a huge pleasure to come back to Durham University and St Cuthbert's in particular. It's always a joy to come back to this university. I was a student here, as, as Ian has uh, indicated, uh, a long time ago, uh, nearly 30 years ago. For those of you interested in Durham history, that is a period of time in history known as the pre-Nando's era. Um, in fact, it was almost pre-everything era. Um, and I, I made a fatal mistake in preparation for this evening's lecture. I made the mistake of uh, reviewing who has previously given this particular lecture over the last few years. And having reviewed that list of notable celebrities, I can say that I probably hold the accolade this evening of being the least auspicious, least academically qualified, least salubrious of, of them all. Um, so um, that does, however, I think give me a little bit of license. I know the audience in person here is cosier. I know we have some uh, very kind supporters online, uh, but at least um, my uh, non-traditional, non-academic track record perhaps means I can depart slightly from the traditional lecture protocol and introduce just a soupçon of audience participation uh, later on in this presentation. So please work with me on that. You'll enjoy it, I promise you. Um, <laughs> all heckling already, that's what I like to say. Um, can I just check? I know there are some people at the back, if, if you can hear me okay up there. Is my voice carrying up there? Yeah, I'll come on to A-level drama in a minute. Um, it, it, if it's any consolation, I, I do feel your pain. I had the same experience you're about to have when I booked tickets late for The Lion King a couple of weeks ago. I got the, I got the seats right at the back. I could ha hardly hear a thing. Unfortunately, I will be less entertaining than The Lion King, but if you want to move forward, you can do. Um, what, what, what I want to do this evening is just thinking about how to use 50 minutes or so. I, I thought that it would be interesting to present my reflections on two areas or two areas of questions I'm commonly asked about. The first uh, is um, what causes crime? Uh, and the second is um, what do you do in prison to try and reduce that problem? I think returning to the first question, first of all, of what causes crime, I personally feel a more helpful question for prison operatives is what maintains crime. Uh, the cause of crime very often in our uh, arena has already happened and it is more important in our rehabilitative efforts, I would suggest, to think about what are the maintaining processes within uh, crime. So I want to share some reflections on that. And secondly, around the issue of what we're doing. And Ian touched upon this earlier. He, he's interested to hear how we've moved on uh, since 2003. I want to share some specific examples of how psychologically informed approaches within prison have moved on from the traditional uh, accredited offending behavior interventions that we have been doing up until probably two or three years ago. So I'm particularly interested in my role. I have the lead for security and safety within my directorate. I'm particularly interested in how we offer prisoners rehabilitative opportunities, but we must balance that with a pragmatism around those that, that, that cohort's risk and also how we maintain a safe, secure and decent environment while giving prisoners the opportunity to practice new skills, which can themselves be risky and destabilizing. But before I do that, just a quick gallivant through uh, long-term high security prisons. Uh, it might not be an area of business that you are particularly familiar with. Essentially, my directorate is divided into two. There is the south of the directorate, which you can see down there in the blue box. Those establishments there fall to my colleague, uh, Will Stiles, who is the prison group director for the south of the region. And they are my pride and joy, my favorite prisons in the whole world. We have Franklin, Full Sutton, Wakefield, Gartree, Garth and Manchester. Uh, the three uh, red establishments there are what we call high security dispersals. And then we have three category B uh, long term prisons in Garth, Manchester and Gartree. So they are the prisons that I have uh, primary responsibility for. And uh, some of the interventions I'm going to talk about this evening um, relate to, to those establishments. Before I go on to um, talk about the here and now, I just want to take a step back, and I promise this will be brief. 
Uh, I just want to talk about where we have got to really since the 1970s. And it's just worth reflecting that prior to the 1970s, it was generally regarded in the UK as, as accepted doctrine that treatment for prisoners, assessment and treatment for prisoners, was a legitimate goal of the correctional operations. Uh, so that was something that was generally well regarded. But since the 1970s, and I just want to count up very, very briefly through six key studies that I think are really um, critical in understanding the journey that we've been on since then. Um, the first was in 1974, there was a first suggestion in the mainstream literature uh, within psychology and criminology that actually nothing works in prisons. And that was based upon a wide scale review of the interventions that were available at that time. And that really started what we call now the, the, the what works, nothing works debate. And then from there, though, a few years later, that kind of provoked everybody into a frenzy of, uh, of, of uh, data gathering and, uh, and evaluation. Uh, further studies in 79 and 80 actually reported more positive outcomes. So there was a, a debate raging within the criminological research about actually, is prison uh, worth funding? If so, on what basis and what are the outcomes that we can expect from prisons? But in 1979, the original author from 74 acknowledged actually on the basis of further data that um, there were things that actually worked, but you needed to be specific about for what type of prisoner, what type of intervention works. So it wasn't a case of nothing works or everything works. Some things tended to work for certain specific individuals possessing certain characteristics or particular offence profiles. Moving forward to 1995, there was one of the first major what we call meta-analytic reviews. And for those of you who, um, uh, who like myself, are um, ma mathematically phobic, a meta-analysis is a statistical method where um, the, 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 the outcomes from lots of different studies are statistically pulled and their effect size or the magnitude of the effect, the treatment effect, uh, is graded. And just to give you an idea there, where we're talking about an effect size of between plus 0.5 and plus 36, what that's saying is that compared to the control group who did nothing, the treatment group can be expected to have uh, recidivism rates of between uh, 5 and 36% less than the people that did nothing. So it's showing that the, the, that the effect sizes were between 5 and 36%. So that was the improvement rates that were found by Losel in 95. And then again in uh, 2000, so replicated partially, but with a bigger pool of studies, um, uh, uh, Maguire found that a mean reduction of around five and 10% could be expected for most prison-based and probation-based interventions. And um, 2002 was really critical uh, in terms of trying to capture the learning from all of that meta-analytic data and uh, the authors reported that best practice in correctional programs tends to use a structured cognitive behavioural approach. And it is that really from 2002, which has lived with us since. But what I want to emphasise this evening is not so much uh, the specific interventions, because uh, the academic literature is clearly replete with lots of material evaluating the efficacy of intervention. So I'm not going to talk any more about those studies. What I'm going to do instead is focus on the context in which those interventions exist. Because one of the things it could be said that these earlier studies could be criticised for is empirically drilling into the efficacy of individual interventions and programs, whether it be an education intervention, an offending behavior intervention, or a cognitive behavioral intervention. But actually, what some of those studies ignored was the quality of the context in which those interventions are delivered. And I'm talking here about the prison context. What I'm gonna suggest this evening is that it's really important for a number of key uh, reasons that I'm gonna explain that the prison context should in some important um, ways reflect and emulate what the prisoner is likely to expect in the community. So in that sense, we might call that ecological validity. So the prison should have some ecological validity 
because we and, and some parity with the environment that we are sending that individual back out into. So it, for, for, for that reason, forgive me if today I do not go into too much detail about these specific interventions. There's been lots of presentations on that before, and there's lots of stuff in the literature about that. But I want to talk about my reflections of what ingredients of good prisons can facilitate and enhance the impact of some of these interventions. Um, I do love this quotation by um, Peter Drucker, which is that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think as good civil servants, we need to remember this from time to time. We spend a lot of time in prisons and probation talking about process and policy. But actually, very often, you can have the greatest strategy in the world, but if your environmental envelope that that strategy exists within is suboptimal, uh, you are going to have poor outcomes. And I think in prison environments, we have seen that decency, transparency, uh, legitimacy, all of the things that make a good quality relationship between staff and prisoners, they are as, if not more important than the actual material you deliver in the group room, the therapy room, the classroom, or the workshop. So turning to the first theme or the first question, about what maintains criminal behavior. I just want to do a very quick experiment with you, okay? You've nothing to lose, but the only person who's gonna look stupid here is me. Roughly, I want to divide the room into two. So we've got over here some explorers, and over here, we've got some tribes, tribes people. And I want you to consider this scenario. So um, you are traveling in South America and come across a tribe that get up just before dawn every single morning to ritualistically say a prayer. You ask why they do this and are told that this prayer ensures that the sun rises each day. Without the prayer, the sun may never rise and that will be <laughs> catastrophic for the whole planet. You ask how long have they been doing this and you're told that this is a tradition that has been handed down from beyond memory. You say that no one else does this and are told that the whole planet therefore relies on their daily ritual. So, to the, I did say you were explorers, didn't I? Thank you, already enrolled there, I see. To the explorers, I want you just with a couple of people sitting next to you, just for a literature, this is going to be one or two minutes. So work quickly. I want you to think of questions, generate some questions that seek to establish more about why the tribe's people perform the ritual, what the tribe fear, and what evidence they have for supporting their beliefs. Have you got that? Yeah? Tribe's people, I want you to think again in groups of two or whoever sitting next to you, think of all the good reasons why you must perform this ritual and consider the evidence that supports its continuation. Just literally lean across for one or two minutes and have those conversations. And I will be asking for a little bit of feedback from you. <laughs> Thirty seconds. <laughs> 
Okay, thanks. Sorry, I, I, I hate to rush anthropology, but I want a tight time budget. So, explorers, give me a question in relation to uh, that you would want to ask the tribes people to understand more about what they fear. Be why, right. why is it their responsibility uh, and only their responsibility to save the entire world? Any comment? Well, we don't know that the rest of the world's not doing it, but just in case we, we do it for us, but if it benefits the whole world, then that's great. We may not believe that no one else does it. Altruism. <laughs> Another question about what they're trying to what they're trying to avoid, what they fit, what, what is it they're trying to stop happening? Any questions around that? Any questions about what their evidence is? Yeah. Have you ever not done it and it hasn't raised it on the next day? Maybe I'll have oh, a killer question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Do we have an answer? We, we can't risk that. No. Well, yeah. it's too much. We, we did we risk one. We cannot risk it. It failed to rise. It failed to rise on the day that there was an eclipse. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> oh. <laughs> Any other questions around? Any other questions around the evidence base? <laughs> Any other questions you've got at all that haven't been asked? Anything at all? Oh, be brave. One more, one more, because they're on a roll. <laughs> so the sun rises at different times, uh, like throughout the year. So does that mean that your prayers are not working or they're not as strong as they were before? What's happening there? Any response to that? The sun's rising, rising at different times. So it doesn't matter. Prayer's good for 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... Now we've done that, my final question, just to the tribes folk, and you can all shout this answer at me simultaneously, so please be loud and brave. Did the explorer's questions help you to refrain from your behavior? No. Now, listen, I must be actually, I must be actually clairvoyant. <laughs> <laughs> However, I'm always prepared for any outcome. So what I'm trying to, uh, what I'm trying to articulate there in that example is that uh, we all uh, hold beliefs which are based upon our experience. And that actually, even when we're asked questions to interrogate those beliefs, we are oftentimes very reluctant to let them go because we are afraid of what the outcome might be of behaving or thinking differently. I'd like you to just hang on to that because I'm going to port that later on to uh, talking about uh, criminality. And just as a segue into that, uh, I just want to very briefly introduce you to Aaron Beck, who is one of my personal heroes. Uh, Aaron Beck is the uh, father of cognitive therapy. And his model um, from the 60s and 70s was absolutely transformational in terms of psychological practice, in my opinion. He took us from a fairly psychoanalytical person-centered based approach, both of which have their strengths, uh, into under trying to understand the link between our beliefs, how our beliefs influence the actual physical way sometimes we see the world, and then how that view can influence our behavior. And that actually what powers that whole system of maintaining those beliefs is anxiety and fear about what adopting a new set of beliefs might feel like because of personal cost. So that is what that, that is the way in which that's that is a, a tragic oversimplification. But that is the way in which Beck attempted to conceptualize various forms of psychological distress. And before I move on to crime, forgive the pun, I am just going to illustrate that concept with um, the um, experience of panic disorder, uh, which is a very common, which is a, a condition which is very commonly and effectively treated by cognitive therapy. So within panic disorder, uh, people will very commonly have what we call some kind of a trigger. 
So it might be a twinge in the chest muscles. It might happen purely by accident. It might happen because we've been exerting ourselves. It might happen because we're feeling anxious about something else. But that is the precipitating experience. But the critical thing is that for some people, that will lead to thinking or, um, a, 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 um, or a, a, an assumption, something on the lines of there must be something wrong with me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm having a heart attack or I could be having a heart attack, or if I don't do something quickly, I might have a heart attack. And what's critical in panic is that there must be a perceived threat. Whether that is accurate or not, it is that belief which powers the whole system. Because it is that belief, as you can see, leads to anxiety. That anxiety in itself is a physical manifestation. So that anxiety will then lead to muscles tightening, chest becoming laboured, dizzy, which of course fuels the original catastrophic belief, which is I might be having a heart attack. And then as a result of those physical sensations, there are a number of key beliefs. My heart will stop and I'll die. People will notice I'm anxious. You'll notice some percentages next to those. I'll come back to those later. Um, now, here is the really, really important part of the cognitive model. I say it's important because it's the one part of the cognitive model that a lot of practitioners and therapists actually forget exists. And it is that when you are having catastrophic thoughts about what's going to happen to you, you will engage in a series of what we call safety seeking behaviors. I know it says safety behaviors there. I think it's more accurately termed safety seeking behaviors. And in this case of panic, the patient might take paracetamol, might rest, stop, sit down, take deep breaths, monitor heart rate. But you'll notice that the model then flows back in to anxiety. Can anybody think why? Why does doing these quite sensible, decent uh, things to try and make, us, make you feel better, why should that lead to further anxiety? They might not work. They might not work. Or worse, they might work in the short term by reducing your anxiety, but what do they do as an unwanted, unintended consequence? Exactly. Whew. Thank goodness me, I did those things. If I hadn't have done those things, I would have had a heart attack and died. So the reason that I call them safety seeking behaviours is because they do indeed afford a degree of short term safety, but at the longer term cost of continuing to fuel the original unhelpful belief. And that is the power of cognitive therapy in terms of understanding psychological issues. Two circles there, really critical. The blue circle is about the assumptions or the beliefs, and the yellow gold circle is about the safety behaviours. And we'll return to those concepts very shortly. So there are the examples in that particular uh, model of those predictions and safety behaviours. And what we see is that the predictions lead to the safety behaviours, the safety behaviours do produce short-term relief, but they also in turn prevent what we call disconfirmation of the original belief. So they essentially, the phrase I like to use as a bit of a sci-fi fan, they sort of hold that person in cryogenic freeze. They freeze that person's ability to escape from their anxiety because short-term relief is very, very addictive and seductive. Now, you might be wondering then, how on earth does all of this relate to uh, criminality? And I just want to explain how. So going back to the uh, example that we started with, I just had a bash at what I thought the sort of blue circle there, the predictions, I think we heard a couple of them from our um, tribes folk, we will fail the whole world if we don't do the ritual and the world will end, essentially. So they are the catastrophic beliefs fueling this extremely labour intensive ritual. But as, as, as uh, my friend up there pointed out, um, at least it's good for 24 hours. <laughs> um, the sun will never come back if we don't do the ritual. And of course, everyone will die. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't think of much more catastrophic a belief than not just I will die, my friends will die. No, no, everyone will die. So this is why the ritual has so much labour put into it. And then on the actual safety behaviours, and so if you're holding these beliefs, 
you're going to go you're going to go to quite an extent you're going to go to some significant lengths aren't you to um, make sure that doesn't happen so you perform the ritual without foul you teach others about the ritual you impose laws and punishments supporting the ritual and you increase the duration and the frequency of the ritual so you kind of get to that point where you say actually i'm going to do a really big ritual today because that will tide me over until this time tomorrow so they are the safety behaviors so thinking about that cognitive approach then into offending behavior i want to um, introduce you to a pilot program that i um uh, implemented at HMP Franklin, which is a high security dispersal prison, not a stone's throw from here, just outside Durham between here and Chesterley Street. It is one of the largest high security prisons in the country um, and holds a really high risk population of um, uh, including um, terrorists and offenders with um, organised crime backgrounds. Um, so just moving on then from um, what maintains crime to what we do using that knowledge of maintenance processes. So you know, we've got an idea that crime might be maintained by safety behaviours, that there are a number of things that offenders do which are harmful to others and also to themselves, but they do it in order to keep themselves safe. It might be reputationally, it might be financially, it might be physically, but they do these things because they have learned that there is short-term pay, there is short-term reward in safety by perpetuating uh, criminal behaviours. Breaking that cycle, particularly with offenders in a place like Franklin, who might have 25 years of offending histories, and they might be serving another 25 years in prison, is really difficult. But of that population, and even more difficult uh, and unreachable population are those who are segregated within a high security prison. So these are the prisoners for whom we cannot trust in normal circulation within the high security environment. So they are segregated in a separate unit. And what you tend to find in dispersal prisons like Franklin is that prisoners who are segregated will be segregated for a very long period of time. We're not talking segregation for seven days cellular confinement. We might be talking about prisoners who have been segregated for over a year. And the task is to identify what their individual formulations are, what their individual safety behaviours are, and their individual predictions, which are holding them in that really undesirable and unhealthy situation. So we designed around the model that you've just seen, around the cognitive model, we designed a um, three-stage case management approach involving the first phase, which was about formulating understanding the neurodiversity factors. So for, for, for example, we often find that um, uh, offenders with autistic spectrum disorder, uh, various other forms of learning disability. We also find a lot of psychological conditions like anxiety and PTSD, tr early tr trauma, but also those things feed into their individual formulation of the things that they're doing that are unhelpful, but at least give them some kind of short-term relief. So that happens in phase one. Moving on to phase two, which is a staged and progressive re-socialization into normal conditions. So once, once the prisoner has an understanding of what their unique triggers and what their unique vulnerabilities are, what their safety behaviors are, and have been given an opportunity to try out doing something different to their stock shelf um, uh, behavior they resort to, once we've seen some evidence that they are willing at least to behave in a less chaotic or less refractory way, we then test them by giving them progressive levels of freedom in less confined, constrained environments. Um, and that might be, for example, it says they're Westgate Unit 2. Westgate is Franklin's personal disorder unit, which is an excellent environment. It's a high quality environment to test out new beliefs, to test out new behaviours. And over a period of time, and bear in mind, there's no, there's no chronology on here. We could be talking a year or more for this process to work. And also, it's not linear. So prisoners will commonly flip-flop backwards and forwards from different stages. So they might start off in 
phase one, move to phase two, they have to go back to phase one. They need to go back into segregation conditions to revisit and rebolster their uh, formulation because we're finding that in a, uh, a less secure environment, uh, old behaviours and old habits are breaking through. But for a number of prisoners, and we have had significant success with this approach, phase three is a permanent relocation where the prisoner is removed from segregated conditions onto one of the other units that we might have. So for example, the PD, personality disorder unit, main location at the prison, or another long-term high security specialist unit or a transfer, sometimes transfer to medium secure units are possible at this stage as well. So this model is a real life example that you can, you can actually breathe life into a good quality cognitive formulation. And one of the difficulties that we have in the prison service is that um, there isn't enough good quality cognitive behavioral formulation going on and that we need to inject more of it in order to make approaches like this effective. So, it, so I made a comment at the start of the presentation. I'm not going to talk about specific interventions. So the programs we run, the sex offender treatment program, uh, you know, violent, violent programs, even we have desistance and de-radicalization programs for terrorist offenders. I'm not going to talk about those programs because actually sitting outside of those programs is essentially where all of the high quality psychological work should happen. It is where the person, the prisoner, should be engaging with their environment in new and different ways in order to behave and think differently. That doesn't happen in a program. It happens outside in their living context. So just to, I want to just again, just breathe a little bit of life into this. I want to give you a snapshot of the type of prisoner that we might work with through the model that I have just described to you. So I'll introduce you to Colin. This is anonymized. 35 year old man, sentenced in 2014 for murder and possession of a firearm. He's a category A prisoner. Category A prisoners are those for whom escape must be made impossible because they present uh, national security or significant risk to uh, the country. Now, Collins index offence involved the execution style killing of a man outside a pub in a major UK city. And uh, he's clearly connected to an organised crime group. And now the murder was directed by the organised crime group leaders in connection with a territory dispute with a rival crime group associated with drug importation. This is a very common type of offence profile that we're looking at here. Now, Colin also has previous convictions for battery, wounding with intent, possession of a firearm. And this is Colin's third custodial disposal, having served two years in a YOI at age 19, and plus that, a five-year sentence for wounding. He was released in 2011 from that. Now, since imprisonment, Colin spent the majority of his time in segregation units. Uh, he often requests transfers to different prisons, saying that he has a desire and intention to progress to a new establishment, but then actually doesn't materialise. And we do sus suspect whether he might be wanting to engineer transfers in order to advance his nefarious crime-related activities in prison. Now, Colin tells us that he suspects that, um, that he will be attacked and staff believe him, that because he has such a high profile, um, organized crime profile, that there will be other prisoners in those prisons, in those dispersal prisons, who will also want to um, neutralize him, take him out, harm him. And we've seen over the last two years that his behavior has deteriorated. So he's been on dirty protest in segregation. I won't spell that one out to you, you can use your imagination. Um, assaults on segregation unit staff have been very common. Now, the psychologist working in that prison described Colin as entrenched in a disengaged stance. He generally doesn't interact with staff. He's on, anti, he's on antidepressant medication, but he's actually suspected that he hoards the tablets and doesn't take them. He's awaiting a court appearance for biting off a member of staff's ear in 2020. So th this is a very common uh, type of prisoner that we might find in the conditions I described to you, i.e. long-term segregation, over a year, very entrenched, very disengaged, very violent. Now, the task for us is to think then at stage one of that model, what are Colin's predictions that are fueling his violent and chaotic behaviour? 
And what are his safety behaviours? What is he doing to keep himself safe? He lives in a very hostile environment. I'm not talking about prison here. I'm talking about his mind. Colin's life has been about exacting violence on others, avoiding violence from others, and being a very high profile, credible leader of an extremely violent, well-connected, well-resourced um, crime group, often involving multinational or overseas um, uh, activities. So he has a lot to lose. He feels he has a lot to protect. So in the case management work that we did with Colin, we decided to identify a behavior that we would like to start with. So we prioritized, when you're doing a cognitive formulation, you'd often ask yourself, let's not necessarily start with the most difficult behavior. Let's start with the behavior that affects progress in managing other behaviors. So let's start with the treatment impairing behavior. And clearly, isolating yourself and not speaking to anybody is a treatment impairing behavior. Because unless we get this one sorted, we're not going to make much headway in some of the other behaviors uh, more seriously linked to violence. So let's think about that cognitive model. So we know that Colin has beliefs like, if I keep my distance from everybody else, then people can't harm me. I need to keep a distance, a physical distance, so I can see people coming, a mental, psychological distance, so that I don't get involved. I need to be on my toes at all times. People cannot be trusted. And if I let people get too close, they will exploit me, because it's happened before, always, almost. And if I do trust people and they take the mick, I will look weak, which in my culture, my environment is totally unacceptable. So they were the assumptions that we managed to garner from Colin. And then we identified, well, in terms of you wanting to isolate yourself, what are the key triggers? And we identified that staff trying to get too close or sticking their nose in, that's his perception. Wanting something where you're suspicious of the motives, they might be asking questions that they, he doesn't know where it's going. Staff seeking information making him feel stupid or inferior, invading his space, that might just be coming into his cell or into the, into the doorway of his cell, that might be enough, uh, and low mood and feeling stressed. So they were all the triggers that he could identify that led to him wanting to enact this behaviour of isolating self. Now, when he does isolate himself, this is what he does. He becomes aggressive, rejecting. He will disrupt the unit. He will avoid sharing problems. He will engage in solitary hobbies. For example, he will do multiple press-ups. He will do thousands of press-ups a day. I have never seen anybody do press-ups like that. I'll be surprised to learn I couldn't even do the number of press-ups I'm describing here. He would be absolutely hell-bent on doing press-ups and, and isolated exercises and remains in his cell. So what we have here then are we have his responses of avoidance which do keep him safe, but of course what they also do is they rob him of the opportunity of ever disconfirming his original belief. Because whilst he is withdrawn, and whilst he is solitary and aggressive, no one wants to come near him, and so therefore he never gets the opportunity to disconfirm his original belief that actually sometimes, in some circumstances, some people can be trusted. We don't want to leave prisoners with unrealistic beliefs. The therapeutic goal here isn't to have Colin believing that the world is a squidgy marshmallow and everybody's full of love and wants to sit with him and have tea with him on a beanbag. That is not a functional belief for Colin, but actually a more functional belief for Colin might be some people can be trusted. I just need to find out a bit more about them before I make a decision. That will be a more progressive belief for him. So we have the responses which prevent this confirmation and we also have the uh, original predictions up there, which fuel the whole model. And it is working systematically like this. With prisoners, you can actually start to see the penny drop as they start to work through their formulation with you. So you might be wondering, well, OK, that's great. You've drawn it all out. It looks pretty. You've got orange boxes, whatnot. What do you do with it? One of the ways that we would try to disrupt and reformulate 
some of this really unhelpful cyclical processing is to ask the prisoner to engage in some experiments, a bit like I did with you guys earlier. So we ran an experiment and I was right, obviously, but the experiment was, we don't know what the answer is. We need to run the experiment to find out what the answer is. So really adopting a scientific methodology, but not in a scary sort of chemistry or physics way, because that's above my head, but just really about identifying what the variables you want to test are and then actually seeing what the answer to that is. So let me give you an example of how we did this with Colin. So this, what you're looking at here, is a behavioural experiment. Very commonly used in cognitive therapy, very effective with people with depression, anxiety, and panic. So what you ask the prisoner to do is to describe what the target belief is. So you might say to Colin, so okay, we've, we've had a look at your formulation, there it is, it's all written out. What do you think the most important belief there is? What's the one that's causing you to do this the most? And he might say, if I let staff get too close to me, they will exploit me. Now, the 90%, I said, I'll come back to it. You then say to him, how much do you believe that out of 100? He says 90. So you write it down. Then you say, well, OK, well, let's see. In like, let, let, you know, let's, let's throw caution to the wind. If we were to try and test whether that's accurate in all cases, how would we do it? So you would design an experiment. And this was the experiment that Colin designed. When staff come into my cell, allow them to speak to me. That's all. Low, this is low risk stuff. Don't threaten them to get them out too quickly. He wanted that put in brackets. Too quickly. See how they react and respond to me before reacting. You can see we have a very suspicious individual here. And there needs to be a little bit of kind of shepherding through this process because he's thinking this is a load of rubbish. But actually, here was the outcome and learning. I let the staff in and they asked me about my canteen sheet, which is like the stuff that you order every week, like confectionery and stuff like that. They asked to check a leaking tap to report it. They seemed surprised to my changing stance. They didn't seem to want to get one over yet. <laughs> New belief strength, 70. Does anybody have a hazard to guess what that means, 70? What does that tell you, anybody? Well, it's a re reduction of 20%. Yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? 70. It's not low, is it? So this is a good example of where, as a psychologist or a prison uh, manager, persistence and tenacity will win the day, even when your experiment is not fully successful. Because... These are experiments that in reality you need to repeat over and over and over again because this guy is very heavily invested in this failing because there's going to come a point, isn't there, where Colin thinks, I've been really daft because I've been doing this for 30 years and now you're telling me that this has been a bit of a waste of effort. So you shouldn't underestimate with criminal behaviour the over-investment that individuals have in at all costs trying to defend their original stance, because there comes a point of realisation where persistent offenders think, crikey, they might not say it to you ever, they may never articulate this through pride, but they may privately think, I've done this wrong since I was about 15. And they might be in their 50s. That's really difficult. So that is an example of a behavioural experiment. The second um, example that I just want to share with you uh, around the application of psychology to improving the therapeutic environment within prisons is around um, our work with trauma. And this is such an important area because research has started to really highlight for practitioners in prisons the central importance of early trauma experiences in the um, production of criminal histories. So you tend to find that people who commit crime, violent sexual crime, equisitive offending, will have some history of um, sexual, physical or neglect, abuse. And um, we call them ACEs for short, ad adverse childhood experiences, and they are very common within our particular um, client group. The importance of them in terms of reducing crime, though, is that they are important derailers, as I've called them there, they're important derailers of normal cognitive or effective emotional functioning. So we actually see evidence that where somebody encounters trauma at an early age, 
it disrupts their learning, it disrupts their language development, it can disrupt their intellectual development, but also their emotional development. So therefore, those factors make them less resilient to the influences of crime as they reach uh, um, late childhood, uh, early teenage years. And here are some examples that we would focus upon uh, with prisoners. I just think, just privately, I, I, this isn't going to be an audience participation uh, event, but I just want you to think privately to yourself for a moment. Have a look at those um, ACEs, those childhood experiences, and just have a think about any that might apply to you or to people that you know. Just have a think about those. Because some research has um, identified that, generally speaking, in non-forensic populations, so in, in uh, non-prison populations, people can usually sustain about two or three of these and remain broadly functional, broadly. Most of our offenders will have seven, eight or nine. So their world experience is significantly skewed. And this is where we also enter the purview of personality disorder. And we have a very high prevalency of personality disorder in high security prisons. Broadly speaking, attributable, I would say, to early derailers within their emotional processing of these, of these individuals. So these are very, very important to identify when if we have any serious hope of trying to help people work through those experiences. And in 2015, there was a Welsh study, it's called the Welsh study, and it, it produced some really compelling data, which I won't read through, you can see it there for yourself. So what you're seeing here is some empirical support for the power, the disruptive power of early childhood adverse, um, adverse experiences. So what do we do about that in prison? Well, the first example I showed you was about direct case management work with prisoners. This example is about how we use frontline staff on a more global level to work in a different way with prisoners. So what I just want to introduce you to is some training that we offer frontline prison officer staff who are preparing to work with prisoners. And what we try and do is we try to introduce them to the concept of ACEs and how those ACEs may well have disrupted the prisoner's normal functioning. And the reason that we do that, we're not trying to be, we're not trying to create therapists of our prison officers. But at the very least, we are trying to diffuse the frustration and sometimes um, anxiety that prison staff feel working with prisoners who can sometimes behave in inexplicably chaotic, irrational or unreasonable ways. They might be refractory for no apparent reason. They might become violent and aggressive and unreasonable for no apparent reason. And actually what we found is that through systematic training of prison officers, we're able to reduce that dynamic and therefore uh, improve the working relationship between staff and prisoner. If we can keep that dialogue between staff and prisoner going, it leaves the door open for the prisoner to actually work more constructively with us later. We've seen from the experience of Colin, haven't we? If we get it wrong and we end up segregating prisoners because they've become totally disengaged from us as a service or from us as a staff group, once we lose that prisoner, it can take years of hard work to get it back. So this initiative is about trying to help frontline staff recognise before it becomes a problem that, that prisoners may behave in ways that are consistent with being traumatised. So what I'd like to do is just for a few moments, show you an, a video. This is a real life training video that we, will, that we do use with prison staff to introduce them to the concept of adverse childhood experiences. <laughs> My parents don't understand. All the drinking and fighting means I'm scared. I'd like a cuddle, perhaps a bedtime story, but mostly I'd like them to stop shouting at me. And sometimes they hit me. Feeling scared every day and not feeling loved or wanted will change me for the rest of my life. Later, I'll have problems at school. 
problems with alcohol and I'll get in trouble with the police. What's happening to me right now means I'm more likely to have serious health problems in middle age and die sooner than I should. Doctors say my life is full of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. But in my world, this means I see my dad hitting my mum. Dad's got a drinking problem, and mum's always crying, even with the tablets. I am always being shouted at and hit. After the booze and fags, there's not a lot of money for toys or clothes, or even food. I'm getting used to being scared all the time, now I'm just angry. Doctors say things are changing inside me. My brain isn't learning how to control my feelings properly. My body can't relax like those kids who don't have aces, so my body won't be able to repair itself properly when I get older, making it more likely I'll get cancer or heart disease as an adult. It hurts when my parents hit me, but the real damage is hidden, and that damage will be with me for life. I drink and smoke. They say I'm out of control, but I'm not. It's just my way of coping with my aces. I've been in plenty of fights, but what's wrong with that? Kids' punches don't hurt half as much as when my dad hits me. I beat up a kid last week at school because he looked at me weird. Who cares? I ended up with more time out of school. Learning's not for me anyway, and the teachers don't care any more than my parents. I don't like the way anyone looks at me except my girl. She's 16 and pregnant. Just like my mum was with me. So this is where I've ended up. I've got diabetes and cancer's probably on the way. I know these kill you, but I couldn't do without them. I've never had a proper job and I've spent time inside. I hit my kids. I hit their mum too, until she left, so my kids have grown up with aces. And now my daughter had her first kid. She's 16. The course of my life was set in the wrong direction a long time ago. I know where I'm heading, and sadly I know where my kids are heading too. This doesn't have to happen. A little help in childhood makes a big difference to where life takes you. When I was a baby, the nurses noticed that my mum wasn't coping and helped her and explained how important my childhood is to the rest of my life. So, with a bit of help, she coped. The police came round after next door complained about the noise from mum and dad fighting. They asked how I was feeling. I told them I was scared all the time. Mum and dad got help, the shouting got better and the hitting stopped. I even got some bedtime stories. I still had problems at school, but the teacher asked me about what was happening at home. I got help controlling my feelings. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough. I'm now married with two children, and I've got a job. Most of the time. I haven't repeated the same problems with my kids. We got help when being a parent got too much. Our children are ace-free, and that means their kids stand a good chance of growing up ace-free as well. Almost half the people in England and Wales experienced one ace as a child, and one in ten of us suffered four or more aces. If we stop aces, millions of children would not become smokers or binge drinkers, and levels of violence in adults would be cut in half. Fewer aces in childhood also means fewer adults developing diseases like cancer, heart disease and diabetes in middle age. We all need to be ace aware. Are you? Doctors, police, nurses, teachers, firefighters, and most importantly, parents. The more you know about ACEs, the more you can help stop children growing up with ACEs in their lives. And for those of you who have already suffered ACEs, the more you know, the more you can help yourself and others who have suffered ACEs cope.
So that is how we introduce prison staff to the concept of trauma in prison. And it begins a discussion about what prison officers can do differently to ensure that we get the best possible reactions and responses from prisoners. But remember, the ultimate aim of what we're doing there is not just about helping the prisoner feel better, it's also about keeping an avenue open so that we can work with that individual to ultimately reduce risk to the public. If we have a disengaged prisoner, we rob ourselves of the opportunity of actually reducing his or her risk. I want to just finally um, finish my presentation today on a note of dedication. We're in November now, uh, December and Christmas will shortly be upon us. Um, usually around Christmas time on BBC News or whatever, there's usually a um, heartfelt thank you goes out to the emergency workers across the country. That usually is um, hospital staff, police, fire, um, and ambulance workers. All of those people do an absolutely fantastic job. It always vexes and upsets me that prison staff are never mentioned at that time, but yet at Christmas time, prison staff are looking after some of the most distraught and high risk people within our population. I also want to dedicate this presentation today to the 236 staff and prisoners who died during the COVID pandemic. Of the 54 staff across our service who died, many did so whilst coming into work each day into clearly high risk zones of infection, putting themselves in harm's way because they knew that they needed to look after prisoners who also had COVID in a very, uh, well, in a very uh, con confined environment. So this presentation is dedicated to the frontline prison staff and prison officers who have sadly lost their life through COVID, but lost their lives in looking after our 79,000 prisoners in England and Wales. Thank you very much indeed for listening. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Gary, for both a thought-provoking and, 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 at least until the end, a very entertaining uh, presentation. And you managed to make it, it, it simultaneously informative and uh, entertaining. Those thoughts at the end, the ones that I think we'll all carry away with us, though, seriously. Um, we can now open the... Uh, lecture to questions. Kevin has indicated that he's quite happy to ask questions. Uh, anyone online who wishes to ask a question, if you can post it or indicate to Mark, who is hosting the online um, connection, if they would like to ask a question. But if are there any here, please? Um, I was trying to think about Colin, who, when he would get out, would be surrounded again by a criminal group. Has it ever, ever been considered that you might give someone a new identity, a new name, a new job, and you move him to another part of the country, something? Is that ever been considered as part of the prison, the prison reform regime? <laughs> That's an excellent question. So from the news, from the media, you'll know that there are high profile prisoners who in the past have been given new identities upon release. It's very rarely done because um, there is a public acceptability threshold to meet there. Um, however, in terms of the other, other elements that you listed, sometimes it is actually a condition of the prisoner's release package under what we call multi-agency public protection. When a high risk prisoner is released, that they must reside in a new area. They must not reside with people who were previously instrumental in their criminal behaviour and will need to start a new occupation for which the prison would probably have spent many years training them for, whether it be in IT or industry or some other um, educational pursuit. So we do take very seriously your suggestion around not just putting the, I think that I'm interpreting the thrust of your question wouldn't it be a shame to put the person right back into the environment that was conducive to their criminality in the first place? 
We spend many years trying to plan for that not to happen, particularly with very high risk prisoners like Colin. The difficulty as a service we have, though, are with prisoners who are serving at the other end of the scale. Now, these are not um, Clark, these are not prisoners I tend to deal with much now in my career. I'm talking about the prisoners who are serving less than 12 months in custody. So we're talking about prisoners who are highly recidivistic, so they commit a lot of offences. Their offences tend to be quite low level. They tend to be dealt with by the magistrates' courts. They are in and out of prison at such alarming regularity that we are left with very little time to do any of the things that we might want to do to reduce their risk of reoffending, if that makes sense. So for Colin, ironically, the prognosis is better in some respects than for people at the other end of the spectrum, not within my directorate, but within the locals and the, the lower secure conditions who are in and out very regularly. Thank you. Well, there's a, a question from uh, Isabella Franco online. Um, I can either read her question or Isabella, if you'd like to unmute your microphone and uh, speak, we can either put you on the screen if, if Gavin, you don't mind me um, talking. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Hello, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, I was just popped into the chat box that I'm also a former Cuts girl working in prison reform now. Um, and I just wanted to ask, which I suppose is quite a broad question, but in the case of Colin, um, presumably like most prisoners, he'll be released into the community. What does successful rehabilitation look like to you? Is it those small changes in behavior um, like the ones you mentioned with his sort of fear of opening up to staff or ultimately is the is the only successful rehabilitation that he doesn't reoffend in the future? That is a that's a, a, a super question because um, you could take that in all sorts of directions, couldn't you? I, I think Colin is a very serious offender. So the ultimate aim must be to reduce the seriousness of his offending. And that, I think that touches upon an interesting point. I'm not sure if you had in your mind, but sometimes it's not realistic to assume that an offender will live an offence-free lifestyle. They may well commit misdemeanours, but we need to ensure that we don't see a continuation of the offence profile that I described with very, very risk of high harm. The way we do that, if we think back to the risk responsivity model, this isn't a new model. This is a model I, I trained on uh, as a trainee psychologist a long time ago, that where individuals present with the highest risk, you must have the highest containment and wraparound services. And through, again, multi-agency public protection, through often with organised criminals, you might be looking at intelligence services as well and the police. You need to ensure that you do not create the opportunity for Colin to offend. You cannot simply trust the psychological uh, interventions to hold out. You need to do those interventions because they're really important. But unfortunately, you can't trust that they are going to work. So in a case like Colin, you might be dealing with a high level mapper case you would make sure the wraparound services were almost prohibiting offending. Thank you. Any questions? Gavin, the approach sounds excellent. Um, how much resource and time does it take? And how, how can you do that for a population, which I would guess would be at least 10,000 of the, the 75,000 or the high offender category? So you clearly can't have enough resources. How, how, how do you get there? How do you, you know, where, where's the end state? Well, um, in terms of that prioritisation, I would like to say that um, we prioritise purely on the basis of risk. Not so often, it's actually on the basis of the person's willingness to engage. So we might spend many years just getting them. If you remember that three pillar model, it looked all neat and tidy on the screen. I find PowerPoint slides always do. They don't tend to reflect the reality of real life. But actually, it might take us three years to get him to the point where he's willing to entertain stage one. So actually, in a way, the resource, the resource is sufficient. What we need are more prisoners wanting to engage with it. Um, so actually in high security prisons, uh, it is fair to say that those prisons, not all prisons, but high security prisons are particularly resource uh, rich. And they are for good reason, because they are containing the, you know, uh, the very highest pinnacle of risk within our society. So the availability of staff resources, psychological resources, mental health resources, it is all there in high security prisons. Actually, thinking about it, the challenge will be rolling that model out across all different types. Of, so by the time you get down to Cat C prisons, Cat B trainers, then you would really have a struggle there. 
But ultimately, within long-term high security prisons, the question is about motivation and engagement, not the staff's availability to do the work. Just to follow up on that, hasn't that been a very um, contentious issue recently with people being let out you know, on the assumption that they really have changed, that they really have engaged, who either perhaps have just put up a good pretense or go back into a highly criminal environment where, you know, whatever their intentions are, the pressures are going to be absolutely huge. Clearly, there's nothing you can do to control that, but that must be a considerable anxiety. What, what success, because success is continuous, it's not a one-off thing, is it? Nowhere more do we see the manifestation of the risk that you've just described with it than within um, counter-terrorist um, yeah. yeah. counter field. And what we need to do, and we are doing, is becoming much more sophisticated at identifying the faking good paradigm. So this is about trying to understand over a long period of time, a long <laughs> observational period of time, are the articulations of the prisoner consistent with what we know from their behavior, from what other people see of their behavior, and from the intelligence available. It is that, tri it is that critical triangulation of evidence involving intelligence, which is gonna be the key to assisting the parole board uh, to, um, make to, to, to make dispensations available to, to, to let those people out. It, it, it is, the prison service have a critical role to play in providing good quality information to the parole board. And that is something that we're taking very, very seriously at the moment. You mentioned earlier about uh, the importance of the prison context uh, reflecting the environment in which they would be released into, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on how that can be achieved when a prisoner might be segregated from, you know, even the wider prison community for, as you said, potentially you know, years. How, how, would, how is that being achieved? Well, I'll take you back to the case management model that I described at Franklin. So the, the answer to that is very, very gradually and incrementally, and there is no big bang in the model. So, so to give you a really concrete example of how a day might work for Colin. So Colin is moving from stage one, which is his formulation, when I showed you how his behaviors were meshing in with his thinking. We've identified his safety behaviors. We've identified for him the triggers that will make him want to do something to push people away, either physically or emotionally. We've identified alternative behaviors. So we've, we've said, well, try, try this instead. And that's where, do you remember I was talking about the behavioral experiment? So then what we would do is we'd say, right, we're gonna try this experiment out now in real life. You're gonna leave segregation, but actually on Monday, you're just gonna spend two hours on F-Wing in the prison, main location. You'll spend two hours and the staff will be keeping an eye on you because you're risky. We don't want you punching somebody or getting into bother. And then what we would do is if he was able to articulate some progress and we saw that progress, we would then start to expand and accelerate uh, our demands upon him. So he would be given more opportunities to practice and experiment with more behaviours until we reach a tipping point where we might do an overnight stay on the wing. He might stay on the wing just between Thursday and Friday and then go back to the segregation unit. So it is a kind of a... It's a, it's a parapetetic model where his base home might be se segregation, but he will spend increasing periods of time in different locations of the prison. And then ultimately, that would then become permanent. But like I said, he might flip flat, flop backwards and forwards for many, many months before we got him to the point where he'd experimented enough to prove to himself that these new behaviours are worth trying. It's not about proving it to us. He's got to prove it to himself because he's had these behaviours for 20 years. Does that answer your question? I'd like to follow up on that. Um, so then for short-term prisons, how do you then find that ecological fluidity um, if they don't have that long-term progress um, and they're just being put away? Um, how do you yeah, create good realization? Cracking question. So when you say short-term prisoners, do you mean those serving much shorter sentences? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Those prisoners will be in lower security conditions. I am very unlikely in my prisons to have somebody serving 18 months for, I don't know, stealing a car and um, assault on a police officer, for example. Those prisoners will sit in um, cats, category C or open prisons. Now in those types of establishment, we would be quickly expecting the prisoners to be going out on what we call release on temporary license. 
So we wouldn't need to use the prison context for ecological validity because that prisoner's risk means that they could be safely trusted more or less after assessment in actually going out into the community on short periods of day release. They might have a job. They might work in, we, do, we have a fantastic arrangement with Timpsons um, who, who supply prison work um, to prisoners on release, but also they do some preparatory work with prisons before release, as do a number, we have a whole network of agencies throughout the country who will offer prisoners that ecological experience. So they'll go out of the prison, they might get on the bus, go to work, come back to the prison on the evening. That's quite a common feature of release planning and rehabilitation in CAT C and D prisons. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It's only in high security conditions that we have this unique problem of they might not be going anywhere for 20 years. Our prisons are highly contained. They're highly structured. So how do we give those prisoners the opportunity to test out new behaviours when we're not trusting them to go or do it, to go anywhere or do anything? That's how that's why we've needed to create this case management model. Um. <clears throat> when you're saying you put prisoners into like long term segregation, does that not, like, do you not find it makes them almost more defensive and like react more like easily to their triggers now that they're not seeing people more often? Yes. Like, do they not become more sort of suspicious? Yes, them? absolutely. Absolutely, they do. But that's the reason that's a really important dilemma for us is because what you've, what you've identified there is the trade off between. The prisoner's rehabilitation on the one hand, which is what you're talking about, and the need to keep the prison safe and secure. So it's all well and good to say, actually, for the benefit of that individual prisoner, although he might have assaulted three members of staff, bitten somebody's ear off, assaulted 15 prisoners since last year, we're still going to keep him on normal location because we think it's good for him. But we also have to balance that risk against what harm he's going to do to everybody around him. And unfortunately, there are times, and Colin would be an example of this, where segregation <coughs> is the least harmful option when you balance all the risks to everybody, including Colin, but not just exclusively Colin. Does that answer your question? Let me take one more, because I'm conscious we're approaching half past seven. And, uh, yeah, I was going to say, how does this like translate into the context of young offenders institutes? Well, I guess you have people who don't have such long criminal histories that have the potential to go down that route. Yeah, I have. I mean, one of my career highlights was I was governor of Deerbelt Young Offenders Prison um, for just over three years, and it was probably a career highlight for me for the reason you are just describing because you have a unique opportunity at that age group. So we're talking about young men, generally between the ages of 17 and 21, but mostly 18 and 21, who have some criminal history, but do have the opportunity to divert. And in those establishments like Deerbolt and Aylesbury down south, which is one of our jails in long-term high security, the emphasis is on really intensive educational and rehabilitative programmes. So we... We pump, we, we pump prime, as it were, all of that intervention into those prisons. So you will find much more at Deerbolt than, for example, you might do in a normal adult male cat C trainer. Our hope there is that we are able to disrupt and divert. Unfortunately, recidivism for young offenders is not a good news story. And we need to do more. And we need to think differently about how we manage that particular population. In long-term high security, because we also do have young offenders who come into to, to our estate because they might only be 19, but they've been given a 23 year sentence. We have to think very carefully about how do we prepare that person for release? And how do you keep that person engaged uh, when they will feel resentment and, and they will feel a huge amount of anger for the fact that they're spending really what they perceive as the best part of their life in prison. So. Uh, young offenders present a really unique challenge to us in the prison service. Uh, so you are right to, to highlight that. It is not something I don't think we've, I don't think we've got to, to, to the answer. I don't think we've got to where we want to be. But certainly at the moment, if you went into somewhere like Deerbolt, for example, you would see a huge amount of intervention work going on. And I think at that point, we better draw 
comes to the conclusion. Oh, one final question, I think. Yeah, okay. I'm Very, sure. this really must be the last okay. one. John? You, you talked a lot about culture and the importance of culture at the beginning and uh, the effect of background, childhood background, etc., on the behaviour of, of these, um, these offenders. Uh, and you work, it's brilliant work, to hopefully change a lot of them and improve them and prepare them for rehabilitation. I'm interested in what the culture is in the outside world when they go back in. Uh, and the danger surely there is that um, they may not necessarily have um, fall back into terrible condition initially, but they, they come across so many problems. They can't get a job. Many jobs are actually barred from them. Um, they, they can't, all sorts of things they're unable to do. And isn't the danger that that will, um, if you like, reinstitute in their minds their original attitude towards society and make them feel that their original view of the world was in fact correct. And therefore, you know, I don't, it's a difficult problem, but I think it's one that to avoid undoing all the good work that you're doing, what does society need to do? Okay, so from a civil servant point of view, I would say that the government have very recently published their beating crime plan. Uh, um, the Prime Minister has written a forward to that. And he's committed to undo some of the barring of prisoners into employment. And the civil service is going to be a leader in this. So he has set a target that he wants a significant number of ex-prisoners employed within appropriate, safe government agencies. So we are undertaking that work even now. We need to kind of be the example, don't we, for other employers who might be reticent and reluctant. But I would say that there is a growing body now of private sector organisations, including retail, who are starting to look to prisoners as a very, very valuable source of employment. And actually, where we have, exam we have examples where some organisations might be actually act actively seeking out prisoner uh, employees, whereas 10 years ago they would not. And I think our economic conditions are a factor here. I think the employment market is a factor here, but I think we will have a positive story to tell in, in the coming years. You are absolutely right that employment is one of the most powerful predictive variables of reoffending, and also how important it is in terms of that resentment that you describe in prisoners' formulations to go back to, well, you know, the world's treating me badly. I don't see why I shouldn't go back to treating the world badly. It's absolutely critical. I think that argument's been won. The trick is, as for government, it's about us mobilising what we can offer. But ultimately, we need to seek to persuade the private sector and outside industry to, to follow us. And that is the next, that's the next challenge for us. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask the principal of St. Catherine Society, Professor Tanya Walker, to conclude our meeting. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Gavin, for coming. Um, it's, I mean, it's many, many years ago, as I was saying to you, that I worked at HMP Wakefield myself. And I think it's a fascinating area to be, you know, in the dispersal system anyway, in terms of that. But the project, what you just talked about around the segregation project, is so powerful. It's, it's, it's really, really needed. Uh, across, I think, beyond HMP Franklin as well, in terms of that. But I think some of the stuff, what, you sh what you've talked about this evening has shown how we've moved in the right direction, which with such chaotic and complex prisoners in particular, um, in terms of that. And I think what was interesting, what you were saying about the people who are serving less sentences, you know, the sentences of less than 12 months, that's an area that we really need to work upon as well, isn't it? Because they don't get the resources particularly in them kind of settings, particularly in women's prisons, where a lot of women in prison have sentences less than 12 months in terms of the resource issues, in terms of that as well. Um, I just think it's been fascinating that you've come here this evening and I hope everybody's enjoyed it, both with our new uh, take on the, um, with the Our Worlds and online, which Gavin, I, I must congratulate you. You're a bit apprehensive about going on in terms of that at the start of, of the, um, the lecture this evening. Um, and I just would like to thank Bob, for also organising the event as well, and Mark in particular helping us with the technology side of it in terms of that. So can we just give one final report, um, a pause please for Bob, Mark, and in particular Gavin. Um, <laughs>